Don't you just love to hear the word change? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> you don't want to change. But sometimes we have to. Like, if you don't change the oil and the filter in your car, eventually you're going to pay the piper for not taking care of it. If you don't change the filters in the air conditioning in the church or in your house, eventually it's not going to feel like it's working right. Uh, when you've been out working in the garden in the Arizona hot sun, and you're all dirty and grungy, and you think, man, i got to get cleaned up, it feels so good and refreshing to get a change of clothing in the shower and get everything all ship shape again. Those are very important times of change. Perhaps uh, one change, you're thinking, yeah, it's time for a new car. My old one's rattle trap. Time to give it to KJZ or KBOC and uh, get a benefit out of it and, and get a new set of wheels. Makes you feel rejuvenated and refreshed and able to do some things. Maybe a little bit of a, a new identity when you buy a hybrid. <laughs> I'm a fan of hybrids. Maybe you're going to go on a different vacation to see another culture, another world, and to understand what it's like to be someone else. Uh, that's part of what Rocky and I experienced when we went to Africa to visit with uh, the people in Zimbabwe who were under a great deal of distress <coughs> then and even more distress now, and also uh, with the folks in Tete province, uh, Sebabanda and uh, Netsan Zulu, who helped conduct the evangelistic ministry there. Uh, we experience something of a vitality in the church and people who are alive in the faith because they live the faith of Jesus Christ. But when it comes to change, there's some things we just can't tolerate. Just don't mess with my schedule. Your calendar. Getting things right and in order. You know how habitual we are about things. I have to get down to the kitchen first in the morning and do certain chores. If my wife gets in there, she messes it up. <laughs> She's not here to defend herself. <laughs> Sewing over at Mission Del Sol after church, I think. Yeah, we have these paths in our lives, and something feels wrong when someone messes with it. Uh, I like to think of the days when I said, what, do electronic banking? Look, just give me the checkbook and an adding machine. All of you have an adding machine? <laughs> Calculator? And I'll be happy that I really learned to appreciate Quicken and other forms of doing electronic bookkeeping. And now I wouldn't even think of wanting to go back to trying to balance my checkbook another way. Change. If you come today thinking that everything would be a lot the same, what if we changed the whole order of worship around and you had to find your way through some other thing? Somebody shaking their head, uh -uh, don't do that. If I did that, Terry would be uh, in trouble tomorrow morning, except he's going to be in Nebraska, so he won't be in trouble. <laughs> we did throw in a new hymn that you will learn in a few minutes. In our church, in our daily lives, in our families, we don't really like to change too much, too quick. Or it throws us off. We are slow. In our churches, in particular, we, we are reluctant to move forward in our times. Our motto has been, uh, as I, people used to say to us, we operate by the seven last words of the church. We've never done it that way before. <laughs> and we are going to start now. That's probably the sequel. But there have been certain ways that we did church, and especially back a few years ago. I mean, sometime back, Calvin and all those guys set out how Presbyterians ought to operate. And we're still doing some of the things that they do, or that they prescribe for us. But in the last 50, 70 years, in that length of time, how many of you were born Christian, in some Christian form or another? You don't have to be Presbyterian, just Christian, okay. And you grew up in the church, you're still in the church, maybe you drifted away and came back. You came through the front door of the church. Uh, it was always there, and that was the only way you knew how to live your life. You went to church, and you were involved in the life and work of the church. And uh, we were interested and did things in, in our families and, and as a 
youth that grew up. That's how I got into the ministry. It was part of me. Others come by the second method. The church was doing so much good stuff that you thought, boy, I think I ought to go there and check it out. So we kind of came in through another door of the church and said, you know, I like what's here. I'm going to take out a membership. It's not quite like the, the uh, fitness center where you take out a membership because you got to pay a fee there. Here, everything's voluntary. Um, but those are the styles that we were used to in a life of the church. But somewhere along the way, probably 20, 30 years ago, things started changing a lot. And the church has begun to realize that we're not in the same place that we were. And we can't just sit on our laurels and expect everybody to come flocking in. Because we are losing people out the back door of death. Just look at the age brackets in our churches, and many of us are getting up in years. Or people who slip out the side door of inactivity. Where did so-and-so go? I wonder where they went. Hmm, can't even find them. Well, that's what's happening to the church. People somehow aren't being drawn in in the way that they were. And so it means that we're going to have to change. That's our friendly word, change. We have to do something different. And in our scripture today, Jesus outlined in his last message to his disciples, at least according to Matthew's rendition, what his followers were supposed to do. In Matthew 28, he says, go, make disciples. These are active verbs, you know. Go, make, teach, baptize. Because I taught you, I want you to teach others and show them what it means. Now, it was a challenge for these disciples because they had spent three years just following him around, taking it in, once in a while intervening, telling him not to pay attention to those kids. Well, we know better than that, don't we? We better pay attention to kids because they're the life of our church. But they were just following him around most of the time. But now he's saying, go, do it for me. And these 11 were challenged to tell the story, to invite people to follow, and to awaken the Spirit of God in other people. Because they just went about doing their business of Christianity. They did a pretty decent job because we're all here today. And the ministry of Christ has continued for many, many, many centuries. I think what's important for those 11 disciples is important for us in our day and time because this work of mission and evangelism, they kind of go together. I liked how Kathleen Norris spoke about this when she wrote once. Once I could recognize mission and evangelism not as the matter of talking about faith, but of living it. I could happily connect with Ezra Pond's great admonition to fellow poets when he said, do not describe, present. Show, don't tell us the way that some white writers just write it to try to tell us the story, but do it by presenting. It allows the reader to experience their own sense of what is happening, rather than attempting to control what those people receive at the other end. In a good play, you get totally involved in the presentation and in feeling like you're part of it, and the message comes through clear. That's what we're being called to do as ministers of Jesus and disciples. We are called upon to act in such a way that the disciples were doing. By living his standards, living his way of being, and doing the things that are right in the church. Bob Holmes was a pastor in Helena, Montana, and a chaplain there in the prison system. And he did a commentary on this passage from Matthew. He said, making disciples of all nations can be done by the manner of our lives, by the style of our responses to people, by the values we uphold, by the opinions we express, by our sincere caring for the poor, the oppressed, and other disadvantaged people. Making disciples can happen when we are helping to provide a reconciling strategy for dealing with conflict. We may also do more to communicate the love of God by listening to the distress of another rather than by saying anything, just listening. I found that to be very, very true in my ministry and chaplaincy. I didn't need to say too much. I needed to listen to where those people were in their journey. And they were much more able 
to come to a point of where they express their spiritual needs in the time before a surgery or other kinds of ministry that they needed if I didn't say anything. We are called upon to uh, pay attention to the words of people and get inside their story. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. We may not need to baptize or make that our primary goal. All we have to do is to behave in a manner that the person who's they're observing, who want to be part of that and join in on it. There was a lively discussion about that in the Sunday school class that I sat in on a little while ago. They were discussing this scripture. And we were talking about the frustration of times when you serve someone else and you don't get a chance to give the message of the gospel. Well, part of the message is your presence there. Part of the message is our being present to listen for other people. And that's what we're challenged to do in our ministry every day. Uh, a few months ago, uh, our Presbyterian pastor, Brad Monroe, shared some thoughts about this whole dynamic of what's going on in the church in his eFocus articles online uh, for the Presbyterian. Some of you who might be session members or deacons might have seen uh, Brad's talk about missional church and what it means to be a mission around uh, the world today. And Brad helped me to understand how much we need to change I have been resistant, and I have said, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're out there doing good stuff, that's, that's all we need to do. But I think there's another dimension. Um, and so he challenged us to think through, it's not just that we are helping to build homes for Habitat, uh, it's not just that we might send some money to our friends, Seba and Edson, <coughs> out in Mozambique. We want to do those things, those are all part of being the church. It's good work, but it's not what mission all means. Brad says the difference goes back to the scripture. It's not something we merely do. It is by necessity something we are. We are. Living missionally is first of all ministry outside of here. Outside of our church and the building. Out of our house. Some years ago when we had great attractional ministries, Churches had a reputation for a youth program, a great preachers, great music program, all kinds of good stuff going on, and people would come, the church would grow. Well, that's not happening anymore. Brad suggested to us that in this new era, there's a new model. The old model, model might have been, you all come, get everybody in. The new model is, go and show. Give the sign of who we are to other people. And then they will know what Christ is all about. It doesn't necessarily mean they will come and sign up. But it may mean they are still captured by the faith. And that's hard for us because we tend to measure things by how many new members did we take in. You know, that's our way of doing it. Some statisticians always measure how we're doing. That's not necessarily it. What counts is living a life of care and compassion, of the burning call for justice, and being the kind of Jesus followers that settle for nothing less than God's shalom, God's peace, God's power, God's life. Are we that kind of Jesus follower? Each of us has to measure for ourselves how we're doing in that regard. Is our church's ministry creating such Jesus followers? The first step is getting outside our comfort zone, changing, doing something unordinary for us, and discovering what God is up to out there that we don't even know is going on, that we need to connect with. And the hard part came in, in these articles that Brad wrote. Uh, the next part is then getting past where we were, the hierarchical style of being a church and the attractional ministry to bring people in here. Being on committees and, you know, I served on all kinds of stuff in the presbytery and I felt like I was doing my thing. I still do that, but I know there's something more. And he's challenging us to say that we should build community, person to person, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, story to story. Much of what's going on in our society today is because we're sharing with people. We are walking with people and hearing who they are and where they are 
and they allow us into their sacred space. That's important for the new generations understanding of who they are and what they want to be. So in this, it is a relational ministry, and it's time for us to take that up as a church. Jesus was into relational ministry. He was in contact with the people. He touched the leper and welcomed him. He healed the crazy man on the road. He knelt to wash the feet of his disciples. He cooked breakfast on the beach after he was raised. That was the story in John's Gospel. And such mission builds on what we find in the community, not necessarily taking what we think the community needs, but finding what it is and responding to it. It might mean a community garden where everyone learns about other people while pulling weeds. That's a very revelatory thing to be down your knees pulling weeds with each other. Many of us have to help each other back up. That's the other one. Um, but at the same time, we learn about people's stories. I used to have a farm in Iowa. Oh, really? And you walk the journey with other people. Sometimes it's a mentoring program in a neighborhood school where you listen to children who tell their stories about what's happening in their lives and, and just helping them grow as people. Kids need that kind of support so bad. In the name of Christ, you can support them. Sometimes it means going to a care facility or nursing home to listen, to be in community with staff who are dealing with stress, with families who are dealing with stress, stress and the people who live there who are trying to deal with long-term illness. It's all very important. Maybe you'll have a discussion with a group of young people at the, low, at the high school uh, about a, a recent film that touches on societal issues. Just listening to kids talk about film. It's going to be very important for their life and development. It means that we are able then to reach out into the world and find the ways that God is acting in the community and that we are identifying with those people. It's a wonderful opportunity, even if it does mean we got to change something. I like the words that were spoken uh, about, uh, quoting Albert Einstein, about being the mark of a genius. They said, a genius is a person willing to explore all the alternatives, not just the most likely solution. And he once said, you know, when I go out to look for a needle in the haystack, I, I don't just go and find the first needle. I move the whole haystack until I found all the needles. We're supposed to be out there finding all of the needles, not just one that we expect to find, but all those variety of needles that are out there. And so to do that, you might be doing some work related to Presbyterian disaster assistance. And Terry mentioned uh, the information that's in the bulletin about PDA. My wife and I are privileged to serve on the national response team for Presbyterian disaster assistance. We are going for our annual meeting uh, next Friday in St. Louis, where we will get some more training and education and learning about our role out there in the community. Uh, just yesterday, members of our team were deployed to Rochelle, Illinois, and uh, Fairdale, Illinois, who were hit by the tornadoes this past week, to do an early assessment of the kinds of things the people there are going to need, because long-term recovery is long-term. Uh, we had a note back from a couple whose home we worked on uh, as a mission trip from Mission Del Sol a couple years ago in New Jersey, and they just wrote about finally getting everything done and getting back to, into their house fully. Uh, we did sheet rocking and other kinds of stuff. There's many ways to be involved in helping other people and listening to their stories. <coughs> Sometimes it means being a mission partner church with some other congregation in our presbytery. In the inner city of Phoenix, uh, on uh, the Native American uh, reservations around us. And it's not so that we can show those people how to do it. It's about being a partner and listening where people are in their journey. We are invited to behave in such a way that people will know who we are and what we stand for. I was reminded of this when I read uh, an article. It was in the Presbyterian Outlook uh, a couple months ago about a church in Jasper, Texas. Jasper, Tex Jasper Texas has a history of, of 
difficulty, strife, and troubles uh, related to uh, racial relationships there. There's prejudice and distrust that is built up there. And the church there, a little Presbyterian church there, is trying to do something to bridge the gap between uh, blacks and uh, uh, white people and uh, trying to get something going within growing Hispanic population there. And this church uh, suffered greatly, as some other communities have uh, since uh, Ferguson, Missouri, and so on. Back before that, these folks had had their own incident with the murder of, of a man there. And it fired up a, a lot of feelings there. And in that community, uh, this church decided to form what they call Peace Beyond Understanding. It's a way of seeking to create a safe place in their community to embody the peace of God. And so they are taking steps by calling a new pastor who's going to serve that church, really on a part-time basis, but she's going to serve there to follow the goals of that church to meet the needs of that community. That is being a missional church. And it's our opportunity to look around us and see where our opportunity is as well. In a few minutes, we're going to sing this song, Gather Us In. And I invite you, as you sing this song, to pay attention to the words. You're going to see the words compassion, fashioning our lives so that we are full of hearts that are true. You're going to see the invitation to be a new light that's shining out of the world and uh, to present the fire of God's love in a fresh way to the world. I hope that you will be inspired by the hymn to take your missional stance in the world around us. So as we are called to be a missional church, to respond to what Jesus told those first disciples, to go and do and teach, baptize and listen. At the church we attended in Albuquerque last week on Easter Sunday, the pastor, Seth Fitch, challenged all of us by saying that Easter was not about finding Jesus in the tomb. Everybody who got there found out he'd already left. He was out there doing the work and was inviting them to catch up and join in the work. And that's what his closing commission was all about. And Seth reminded us, he said, it was our job to take the faith of Easter and to go live like Jesus did and to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. Be a missional church. Take those challenges and opportunities that God has placed before us and remember that we're not going to be there alone. Christ will be with us all the way. Be the church of Jesus Christ today. Amen.